Uh, good morning. Uh, welcome to the 10th meeting of 2016 of the ECCLR committee. The committee has received apologies from Kate Forbes. Uh, before we move on to the first item on the agenda, can I remind everyone present to ensure their mobile phones are on silent for the duration of the meeting? The first item on the agenda is for the committee to consider whether to take item three, which is consideration of evidence held earlier in the meeting, in private. Uh, are we agreed? Agreed? We are agreed. So we now move to agenda item two, which is the draft budget scrutiny 2017-18. Um, we have been joined today by two panels, the first of which is made up of representatives of Scottish Natural Heritage. So can I welcome Ian Ross, Chairman, uh, Ian Jardin, the Chief Executive, and Jane MacDonald, who is the Head of Portfolio Planning and Budgeting. Uh, as you can imagine, ladies and gentlemen, we have some uh, questions for you. Um, so whilst understanding that you, you uh, don't know yet what your budget settlement will be, um, I suppose you, it's a fair assumption on your part that it won't see a substantial increase. So if you're anticipating a decrease in budget, what work has been done up until now identifying areas where you can make savings? Uh, well, Chairman, we, we are participating with our sponsor in terms of contributing information, um, uh, particularly in terms of how you know, our priorities, what we would identify as key priorities. Um, in terms of uh, how we might deal with uh, 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 whatever would be the implications of uh, that budget settlement, I think that's slightly difficult, it's slightly speculative, and I think uh, we await the completion and the conclusion of the budget process. But we have got, a, I think, a fairly well-established approach, a fairly constructive approach in terms of how we take things forward. Can you shed any light on whether you feel you could cope with, uh, with a budget decrease without any great difficulty, or would it present challenges? Oh, I think there's undoubted challenges. I mean, I think we've supplied some information which I think demonstrates uh, the changes that have taken place since, uh, I think, probably 2010-11. And you know, I think it would be false to say that it's not challenging. Uh, I think what I would say, though, is in terms of the approach we've taken, and I think it's a, I think it's a reflection on the capability and the commitment of our staff is that we have been able to deal with that. I think it's very much about a focus on priorities. It's about the way in which we've collaborated with a range of organisations. It's the way in which we've organised SNH and in particular I think it's about how we've looked at other funding opportunities and money that we've been able to take in. Uh, we've had a, a very successful um, programme of looking at shared services and um, the way in which we, whether it's buildings, vehicles, IT systems, uh, but also we've looked at uh, other sources of funding, and we've taken quite considerable um, sources of funding, whether it's Heritage Lottery Fund, whether it's ERDF funding, whether it's EU Life funding. But the reality is, of course, it has an impact. Uh, you know, we've got fewer staff, uh, we've got less money, particularly, that we can uh, support uh, uh, a range of, of uh, you know, grant approaches. But I think that we've dealt with it constructively, and, uh, and I think we've operated in a very smart manner. I don't know if our chief executive would maybe would like to add some comments on that. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, whenever there are, obviously there are these, these budget pressures, there are challenges, um, but there are, there are various ways um, you can address that. And I think we have been quite successful at questioning some of the ways we do things in order to reduce costs, um, looked at partnerships, look at sharing, look at ways of reducing costs. But at the end of the day, you're, you're faced with a series of choices about what you fund and what you don't fund. Um, and obviously at the moment, at this stage in the spending review, we've put forward um, some options where we could prioritise, where there are things that we could deprioritise if, if there aren't resources to do it, or which we could delay and maybe not do next year, but maybe do in future years. And obviously after the, the result of the spending review, um, no doubt the Cabinet Secretary will give us her view on which ones she wants us to prioritise, um, and that's what we'll do. OK, thanks. Let's kind of drill down into some of that. Uh, Alexander Burnett. Uh, um, really on the point of yeah, what the priorities are and, and where the main budget lines are, um, it's, you know, it's good to see that environmental and rural services has kept, keeps pretty consistent uh, from, you know, from this year to next year. Uh, so the headline figure is consistent, but when you actually look down uh, into the components of that, there's, you know, there's considerable uh, differences. So it sort of slightly sort of uh, hides uh, some other issues. Uh, I just wonder where where is the 
uh, explanation of the priorities for, say, the troubling of land reform whilst uh, flooding, which was a major issue last year, remains flat, uh, flat line in spending uh, and something like zero waste uh, reduces. In terms of the zero waste point, could you expand on that? Sorry, I didn't quite... Uh, well, not as specifically about the zero waste. I'm really asking for an explanation as to why, whilst the headline figure for environmental rural services has, been, has remained flat, uh, how the priorities have been assigned uh, below that. But in terms of, of our approach, what we've tried to do is um, it, we, we uh, renewed our corporate plan probably about uh, two years ago, and we tried to ensure that that sort of reflected where we would place emphasis and would also be well aligned in terms of the government's uh, uh, priorities. And essentially, it's making that connection between nature and the ability to deliver wider public benefits. So in effect, there's a win-win there. And that's been reflected in terms of the work that, that we have done. And what we're trying to do is to ensure that there is a, a strong, compatible alignment between benefits to nature and also um, you know, whether it's around sustainable economic development, whether it's around health, whether it's around education, whether it's around climate change. So there is that strong connection. We maximise the, the gain that we can get in terms of the resources we have. I've also tried to take an approach where, yes, we have significantly less money than we did, but we still have a significant resource, and it's about using it to best effect. We still have four, over £48 million at our disposal this year to actually deliver benefit and good for the people of Scotland. Okay. Anybody else want to come in on that? Okay, let's move on uh, to look at the potential impact of EU exit. Uh, David Stewart. Uh, thank you, Convener. Uh, good morning. Um, can I raise the first question around SRDP spending? Um, I was looking at the evidence from NSPB, and the spending from SRDP is really quite significant. Um, for example, from 2008 to 2014, it's over 42 million. Now, at one level, you may argue, so what's the problem? The other side of the coin, of course, is by hoovering up such a substantial part of the Pillar 2 budget, it means that third sector organisations don't have the opportunity to access that funding. Also, is the other danger, as any Harvard Business School review would do if you were a private business, of being over-reliant on one source of funding. How would you respond to that, uh, Mr Ross? Well, I, I think it, just on the general point about uh, European funding, I think clearly we do have some concerns there. I think there is not yet the, the clarity about where things w will be in particularly three or four years' time. And, and yes, uh, it's not just in terms of SRDP, which there's a significant sum of money, but we've also, I think, made very effective use of EU life and also ERDF funding. Uh, there are certain guarantees, you know, for two plus years ahead, but beyond that, um, we don't know. I mean, there is an indication that uh, that monies will be made available, and there have been some comments from the Westminster government. But I think I would certainly be looking for for greater clarity in terms of, you know, some of the replacements that would be, would yeah. be put there. But there is no doubt that if that were, were not there, then that would have a significant impact. And I don't think there's any point in trying to deny it. But what we are doing is we're engaging and, and making information available and trying to bring as much intelligence, working with mm. other partner agencies um, in terms of how that might be mm. moved forward. But I'll maybe turn to well, Ian. Question in there, just for clarity. Of the kind of sums that Dave Stewart's touched upon, um, to what extent is that money directed for recurring spend? To what extent is it directed for one-off expenditure? What I'm getting at is, 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 if this is going to be coming up every year, to what extent is this a problem? I might look to one of my colleagues who might have a <coughs> more detail on that, Jane. I don't know if that's... <coughs> Okay. Okay. Um, well, under the, um, if we look particularly at the SRDP, the agri-environment, mm -hmm. um, these tend to be contracts that cover a number of years, but you can also apply for capital elements within that. So it, it's a mixture of the two. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, what I would say in, in, in response to the general question is that we actually feel we've done really well in terms of accessing European funding. Mm. Um, now, that presents an issue for us now, um, but you know, obviously there's going to be a period where we have to decide if we're not having European funding, what, what replaces it. But in the, the use of SRDP has been extremely helpful um, in tackling some of the, of the issues, particularly the impact of agriculture on the natural environment, which at a European level comes up as one of the big things affecting biodiversity. So, 
being able to use, access SRDP money for a variety of purposes within that has been particularly useful. Um, now, I don't know, obviously, what might follow, but SNH will be keen to, to support the Scottish Government in designing you know, whatever comes next. But yes, it is... Um, I mean, what's the figure here? I mean, 360 million over the net, over the five-year period was what would have been available, um, and so we'd be anxious to try and maintain that source of money as, as an important income. I, I take the point um, to your convener that you would need to be the brand here to work out what exactly is going to happen in two years' time. Um, but we do know some aspects. The UK government start to be repatriating some of our structural funds. The other key point um, is that if we have no substantive trade arrangements with the rest of the EU, we default to the World Trade Organization rules. And you will we'll probably know that the World Trade Organization rules are that you can't subsidize agriculture. Uh, now, that is going to create all sorts of difficulties in the longer term. Once, after the referendum happened, uh, within your organization, did you set up um, a sort of future-proofing plan to look at what your turnips will be to replace that 32 million that you've had over the last eight or so years? Uh, we have done a piece of work, and we've also uh, collaborated with a range of other agencies, both within environment, forestry and beyond. I, 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 a lot of it initially was just as about sharing intelligence, looking at the implication. Uh, we've also had some contact with some of our sister bodies elsewhere in the UK, and that's uh, uh, operating on an ongoing basis. Um, what I can say, though, is I, you know, I don't think we've got the clarity that any of us would like to see in terms of um, how some of the, the SANAT scenarios that you've highlighted will ultimately be addressed. And you know, that's what I meant at the beginning. I think there are, you know, there are significant concerns there. I'm eternally the optimist and assume that uh, a combination of politicians, administrations and agencies will be diligent in the work they do to seek solutions, but those solutions are not yet apparent. Mm. And perhaps a final question for you is, I suppose the key point then is to work out um, how effective is your spend. Clearly, you have systems to work out effectiveness within your organisation. But why are we spending the money on the uplands? Why are we spending it on uh, peatlands? Why are we doing? What is our flood prevention strategy? I mean, how how carefully do you look at the effectiveness of the spend and tying in with these objectives? Well, we have a, a very comprehensive reporting scheme. Uh, and that is regularly reported to our board, and it basically uh, reflects our corporate plan and also the, the national performance indicators and very much responds to the priorities that the Scottish Government has identified in terms of its policies. In, in terms of you know, a summary of the feedback, I, I mean, I, I think I'm, I'm, I'm very well pleased with the effectiveness of that spend and, of course, would be very happy to supply any supplementary uh, information to support that statement. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Convener. Uh, talking of supplementary information, I think go back to the point I made earlier, um, Mr Jarron, you said that there was a mix of spend within the monies, that, on the back of the monies that you received from Europe. But I think we really want to get a feel for the, what the balance is in this, is between capital expenditure and the kind of things that we would expect SNH to carry out on a day-to-day -day basis and, and provide the funding for. So I think we really need to see a bit more information around that, if you could provide that for us. Yeah, I can certainly provide that. Um, I mean, I can provide that across all European funding, because mm -hmm. obviously I think that'd be useful. there's life funding, there's agriculture funding, there's structure funding, there's interreg. So we try and access basically whatever we can. Um, and different things are for different purposes. But I could give you a breakdown across across the yeah. schemes. Um, I mean, just say maybe on the, on the SRDP, obviously we're... We sort of co-administer the SRDP. We're effectively working for Scottish Government in, re in relation to some of the schemes. So we don't have the, if you like, the, the overall view across the SRDP. But I can give you the breakdown for um, the ones we're involved in, which is agri-environment and the access ones mm -hmm. and, and ECAF. I think it goes back to the question that Alexander Burnett raised as well. I mean, when you have to make budget decisions, what are the priorities? What's sacrosanct in the work of SNH and what is it that you can, I don't want to use the phrase cut corners on, but you know what I'm getting at. What, what can be trimmed? What can be treated slightly differently? What is the core work of SNH that must always be protected? 
I mean, the primary focus is on um, uh, the, the NPIs that we report to government. We lead on two and we support two others. Um, and those are also reflected in terms of our, our corporate plan priorities. And what we have done and will do on a regular basis is, is we refresh our corporate plan. The intention is that as we move towards the conclusion of, of this spending review is that we would refresh our corporate plan to make sure it reflects our and Scottish Government's priorities and works within um, I suppose a balance between the reality of what you can deliver and also still retaining uh, certainly a degree of ambition. I think it is important to retain that degree of ambition. Of course, there will always be some new things that come along that you have to take up. Absolutely. I mean, and and you know, the, uh, I mean, it's interesting. I think we can all remember what it was like to deal with budgets which were increasing. But even when you had an increasing budget, you still had a whole range of pressures and tensions and additional responsibilities. Um, obviously, it's a little bit even more challenging if your budget is a declining budget. But as I say, we have a, a very able, committed and innovative staff. And uh, I think we do operate in a, in a smarter way. And I think we, we manage those circumstances very well. OK. Uh, Mark Roscoe. Yeah, I, just, I think it might be useful, convener, if we're getting supplementary information from SNH to, uh, to understand where we are with some of the European projects. So, for example, yeah. you know, we heard last week that a number of projects um, at the sort of pre-application stage are now being withdrawn, including the one for the West Atlantic Woodland. And I think you know, it would be useful to know from yourselves kind of where, where are we, you know, given your knowledge, how many projects have stalled at this point, how many are going forward um, for the next round of applications, um, how many do you think you know, can be sustained going, going forward so we can actually assess what the real impact is on the ground, whether it's about, you know, tackling non-native invasive species such as rhododendrons or hedgehogs or, you know, species reintroductions or whatever, you know, what, what are the kind of pivotal projects that, that may fall by the wayside um, in, in, a, in a kind of Brexit scenario. We're very happy to supply that information and also very happy to try and respond to any specifics at the moment if you, if you want to raise them. I think perhaps Mr Russell's highlighted one or two there. Mm. If you're able to comment on those, that would be useful. Well, I, I mean, I'll give, I'll give an example. I mean, I think one of the important projects that uh, was actually recently launched but is now at the round two level is the, the Green in Infrastructure Fund and that is ERDF funding. <coughs> And you know, we're confident that we will actually be able to deliver um, you know, the, the first phase of that, which probably will bring in about £8.2 million pounds of ERDF funding, and that will be scaled up to about £20 million pounds of, of actual project funding. Now, that's very much about green infrastructure, particularly in urban spaces, and it's, it's that link between um, creating a biodiversity gain but also su supporting people who live in deprived areas. And in fact, there are two schemes that are ongoing in Glasgow at the present time. So that's, that's happening. There's also a, a number of life projects which are ongoing at the moment, eCoco Life, and looking at networks within the central belt which are moving forward. Um, and I think you, you did make reference, I think, to a bid which I think involved the Western Isles in terms of uh, uh, the wager scheme. I think that is one that we have are not proceeding with, I think, uh, Ian. Um, again, I'll maybe look to the Chief Executive and the Head of Budgeting if there's any additional examples that they can cite. Um, yes, just on the, on the general principle, my, my feeling is that things have settled down a bit now. I think there was certainly a phase where there was great uncertainty before various statements were made about commitments about further funding. Particularly in life uh, bids, there's always partners. It's always a consortium. Um, and I think there was definitely a phase where a number of those bodies, not necessarily the public sector bodies, became nervous about the level of commitment they were making and what guarantees there were about the longer term. I think that's largely been addressed by some of the statements from the, the Treasury since. Um, but in that, uh, in that hiatus, if you like, the, the um, Atlantic Oakwoods one didn't go forward in that round. But I think there, there are conversations ongoing about reviving that, maybe restructuring it in some ways to go forward. I think on the invasive ones, what we've gone f going forward with is actually uh, an application to the Heritage Lottery Fund, which um, obviously isn't caught by the European funding issue, and therefore I felt was a, was a kind of better bet for us at the moment um, to develop a, a project for lottery funding rather than uh, a project for life funding. Dave Stewart, do you want to come in? Yes, thanks. Just on that uh, point, convener. Um, I don't know if this was mentioned already, Mr. Jardin, but could, could you just confirm why the life bid to fund the work on the used hedgehogs was withdrawn? Yeah. 
Um, withdrawal is an interesting word. My, my word was it, it didn't go forward. Um, the, <laughs> if, it's, if it's a duck and it waddles, it's a quack. <laughs> <laughs> uh, why didn't it go forward? Um, this is a project that was submitted last year to the European Commission and was turned down. So we knew already it wasn't perhaps the most likely project to be funded. Life funding is competitive. You're not guaranteed mm. anything. It went through last year. It didn't succeed. We considered whether to have another go. We decided to have another go, but that one of the key things that we wanted to see was um, more diversity of funding. So we wanted more partners involved. We wanted to look at other funding sources. When it came forward, there were actually fewer funding sources committed to the project. There were fewer partners involved. At that stage, I felt that its, its chance of success, having failed once, was very low. It would have required a substantial forward commitment from SNH, which meant we couldn't have funded other things if we funded that one. And it was on my desk at the same time as the Heritage Lottery bid, which aimed to do a wider range of invasive species. And I took the view that was a better use of uh, public money than the life project would have been, which had an uncertainty attached to it. Okay. Just for information, when you, you bid for a life project and you're unsuccessful, do you get feedback on why you were unsuccessful? Yes, you do. Yeah. Uh, so, and did that inform the decision you came to? It, it was relevant because one of the, 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 one of the key... Uh, well, there were several key elements of the feedback from the European Commission. Um, I perhaps have to declare at this point that I was actually working in the European Commission at the time um, that uh, these things, although I wasn't working on life project, uh, but to make that clear. Um, one of the key things was because it was, a, it was a project aimed at reducing hedgehog numbers to um, increase the number of waders, um, but it was a time-limited project and the Commission was concerned that there, we could do the project and then we'd still have a problem and they weren't keen on funding projects unless they could be sure you get this money, you get this outcome, and that's it, done. So that was one of the main concerns they had. OK, thanks. I think we've covered that. Let's move on to another topic. Uh, Claudia Beamish. Thank you, Kavina. Good morning to you all. Um, Ian Ross, you've already highlighted the importance um, earlier this morning of um, nature and wider public benefits. And... Uh, I would like to explore with you as a panel now um, what thought has been given to uh, the possibility of redirecting funding to support preventative spend um, from health and social care or agriculture or education uh, portfolios um, and directorates, and, and if so, what dialogue has there been about this possibility? Well, I don't, as you can probably judge, um, I think we uh, do not control the direction of spend from other organisations and agencies, and uh, I suppose my own observation would be it's always going to be very challenging if you're trying to re redirect friend, uh, spending from particularly health, bearing in mind the, the particular challenges that exist there. But what we have done is we've had uh, very active links with a range of other organisations and agencies, and that does include NHS boards and national NHS agencies. And I think that what we've now got is, you know, the recognition of the real um, benefit of the link between nature and health. And, uh, you know, in the past that probably was probably more of an anecdotal evidence base. And I think now there's a much more robust evidence base. So I think you, you do have that active sign off, uh, sign up and support from health boards and others. And um, you know, we have got a number of initiatives that are, are being taken forward that reflect that, some with the Forestry Commission and others, and, and some with, with health boards. But in terms of the sums of money that are redirected, going back to your original point, that are redirected from health boards, I don't think, you know, we're not, we're not talking about large sums of money there. I think that probably comes down to um, making successful bids that probably people from, you know, different areas of government would sign up to and support, and that hasn't as yet happened. Uh, right, thank you. I mean, in terms, I completely appreciate that, that you're, you're given a budget, but uh, the, perhaps I didn't make the point clearly enough that um, what my interest would be is whether um, in conversations with the um, relevant cabinet secretary and ministers um, who, who you are accountable to, 
um, for the spend that you're given, whether you're able to take forward conversations about um, active um, walking and, and connection with the outdoors or whatever, um, and, and ask the Cabinet Secretary if it's possible to break down, to use the old cliche, the, the silos and work a bit in a, in a more preventative way? Well, I think we are actively involved in, in preventative work and a number mm. of initiatives are actually already there, particularly around, I mean, the phrase that we tend to use is the natural health service, but there are a number of initiatives which are in place. And what we do tend to, to make is the link in terms of, for instance, if you even look at something like, um, you know, the, the past network in the Central Scotland Green Network Trust area, if you look at some of the work that's um, be done around the John Muir Way. I mean, part of that is about preventative spend. Uh, you know, and I mentioned the Green Infrastructure Fund. You know, that is about improving you know, that, that, that sense of place where people live and encourage them to be more active. So you know, the link is there, and, you know, and it's quite explicit. Um, and significant resources do go into that from a, a range of, of sources, including some of the, you know, the European funding that we were talking about earlier. And I, I must put on record that I think uh, politicians, our, our own cabinet secretary and others, are extremely supportive of that. Right, thank you. So in terms of the future, um, is that something that SNH might be able to consider to um, have that dialogue about the possibility of other... Um, portfolios um, feeding into this in, in terms of, if you look at um, health and social care and the, the um, importance of shifting um, out of hospital and into home and, uh, and out to nature, hopefully, and for mental well-being and those sort of issues, whether it's possible to consider that um, well, crossover think, between portfolios for the future. Uh, and I think, the, well, I think the dialogue, as I say, is ongoing. The links are there. In terms of the, the decisions on uh, additional funding sources and contributions, I think that um, I think the recognition is there, but the decisions are not ones that we would necessarily make. But we, we think there are there are strong cases that have have been made, and there also are cross portfolio committees that exist. In fact, in fact, our own chief executive sits on, on one of those groups. Ian. Um, yeah, I, I I sit on a group chaired by the the health minister looking at. Um, activity. Um, I'll also be at an event on Friday with the, the um, Health Cabinet Secretary at, um, in Dundee at the hospital there. Um, I think it's one of the areas where I think there are actually really exciting possibilities and it is about preventative spend. Um, but what we need at the moment to be able to do is to demonstrate some real um, outcomes for that. So there's a, there's a lovely theory that says mm -hmm. um, you could do these things and it would benefit health. Um, we need some more projects, I think, to demonstrate real benefits in local communities from investing in the environment. And we also need that, I think, as an organisation to show how valuable environment and natural heritage really is. It's not just an end in itself. It underpins issues around health, around prosperity. And I think some more practical demonstrations of it would be, would be good. Can I ask what the driver is behind that group? Is it looking for you to do more from the SNH point of view to improve health outcomes? Or is it looking to identify areas where health spend could be redirected to help you do what you do? Well, what's the balance in the approach? Um, well, I don't think it starts from, from position that either of those is the right answer. It starts from the position of saying, what would we need to do to increase activity levels that feed on to health? And that could be SNH doing something more, doing something differently. It could be the health sector could... doing something differently. They're all around the table. And I also chair a group called Natural Health Service, where we have these people around the table to try and find these practical demonstrations of what we okay, can do. Okay, it's useful to get that on the record. Mark Ruscombe. Yeah, so the, the, the way that a lot of that work is delivered um, on the ground is through community planning partnerships, isn't it? And each community planning partnership sets out single outcome agreement. So how successful has SNH been in terms of your participation in CPPs? Are we now seeing outcome agreements coming forward binding the NHS to take action, for example, on green space, binding local authorities to increase path networks. And are SNH actually putting money into that, or are you actually seeing other partners putting money into these objectives as a result of your involvement in CPPs? Uh, I, I can certainly confirm that we are actively involved 
in a number of CPPs. Um, I wouldn't say that there's the same level of activity in all of them. I think there are some where we have been more successful, but certainly we're, we're very committed to CPPs and we recognise the benefits that can come from that. And there are a number of examples, just as you've described, where you know that link between um, countryside nature, access and health. I mean, the one that's, um, um, that's taking place at the present time, for instance, is in Highland, actually very close to um, our headquarters at Great Glen House, and in terms of use of green space and encouraging people to be more active and bring benefit to it. And that is based on you know, the NHS board um, signing up to that. Um, some of it's through the CPP, some of it's just, I think, through the benefit of the, of the very strong positive links that we have. And there are other examples around Scotland. I think it's also fair to say that are probably there are some P CPPs where further progress is required, but we're certainly committed to, to engaging. But is it, is it an issue if you can't come to the CPP with a substantial budget to put on the table? Because otherwise you're just sitting there saying, well, you should spend more money, but we don't actually have the budget. No, to I, I, would, I wouldn't agree with that. I think sometimes the <coughs> commitment that we can make is about officers and expertise, and, and, and that, that, that sort of commitment can actually bring a lot of gain as well. There are some examples where we can bring some resources too, but no, I, think, I don't think it's purely about resources. I think it's about hearts and minds and also sometimes just the way in which you use existing resources. Okay, Claudia Beamish. Thank you, Convener. Uh, could, could I look with you further, please, about other portfolios and ask you um, if, in your view, any of them are pursuing uh, priorities or spend which can exacerbate environmental challenges and what sort of dialogue you're able to have um, directly or indirectly with other portfolios uh, in relation to um, how that can be dealt with? Well, I mean, in terms of just wider areas of involvement, um, you know, we certainly have significant involvement around education and there's a number of initiatives that are going forward there. Um, we also have uh, significant involvement in terms of areas like tourism and food and drink, and there are a number of initiatives that are going forward there. In terms of transport, and it links back to some of the points we've made, um, particularly transport where we're actually talking about cycling and walking, again, there's a, a great deal of work around there, particularly linked to infrastructure. Um, and, you know, that's been happening um, for some time. Um, probably those will be the, I think those will be the, the main ones I would highlight at the present time. Again, I would look to colleagues if there's anything they would wish to add. Right, and just um, kindly, and while you're, while you're answering that, um, as well as the positives, which is great to hear about, um, in, in relation to are there areas of priority and spend which are actually exacerbating and, and the challenges that you face in, in delivering your, your remit and your, your aims? I mean, I think there can sometimes be frustrations that we would like to move things uh, uh, forward more quickly, but I think our experience in general has been positive and we recognise the challenges that other people are having to face. We don't, I, I can't identify anywhere where we've encountered any examples where people were reluctant to engage in dialogue and, and look at options. The frustration probably is that at times there perhaps is, is not the immediate resources that could be brought to make things happen. But no, and I think in terms of the understanding and, and the, 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 the cooperative spirit, that certainly exists. Was um, sorry through the convener. Were you yeah. going to comment as well? Ian? Because I, I don't really feel I've teased out enough on this yet. Yeah, uh, I mean the first thing I was going to say was and this really is an area where um, we've seen such a change, certainly during my career, in terms of the degree of integration between different bodies. I mean, when I when I started, I think public bodies sat in their own little corners, um, and I don't think that's true anymore. Um, I think there is, a, there is a lot of dialogue, a lot of contact uh, between public bodies and obviously there's a programme for government and we all sit under that. Um, so I think all of that has helped. I also think SNH is much more engaged um, through issues like planning with bodies like Transport Scotland, Highland Sounds Enterprise. So there's much, there is much more integration. So I think my answer to your question would be, at the moment I don't perceive any areas of, of government activity or spending that are, if you like, inherently endangering any aspect of the natural heritage. I think there are always things that could, but it depends on how they're done. And I think our job is really to influence that. Um, and linking a little bit back to our, uh, our budget, whatever SNH's budget was, we couldn't actually do our job 
unless we actually influenced other parts of government. Um, and that's a, that's a big part of what we do. That requires people, that requires expertise, um, and obviously that's an issue for us, is, is we have to maintain a sufficient core of expertise to be able to properly influence so we can have a conversation about transport or about um, industrial expansion or, or investment where people respect our opinion and we come from a position of knowledge. So, so, could you give me a bit more of an example of in transport or in another area, more specific, please, about what sort of so, dialogue you might And before have? you do that, I, just, just to, 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 to supplement this, this line of questioning from Claudia Beamish, if one takes the example of the fact we have a cabinet subcommittee that looks at climate change, it's, it's a priority. So there's an opportunity across the portfolios to have that dialogue to ensure that climate change is embedded in the work of government and is balanced against things like economic growth. Are you satisfied that without having that scale of mechanism, there are mechanisms within government that ensure that the natural environment is embedded in the thinking of other portfolios? I think it is, yes. Right. I'm not saying it's perfect, and sometimes we have to remind people, but I think the awareness is there. And in terms of, say, transport, an example of where there would be a challenge that you might have a dialogue about or, or another portfolio, just to get, get a bit more specific. Please. OK, so two, two transport examples, maybe the, the new Forth Road Bridge and the duelling of the A9. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, these are both major projects that will have impacts uh, on the environment. Um, but I think the way things are handled now so it's, it's so much better than in the past, is right at the beginning of these projects, there were groups set up, including SNH, to assess the issues at the beginning to make sure we didn't get into a standoff. Mm. And I think that's been one of the keys, is this early engagement issue. And I think that's what happens now that you know, is an improvement, say, on certainly on 20 years ago. And I think that has, has improved uh, over time. So could you say how that's made... Uh, the dueling of the A9, uh, in your view, perhaps better? Well, I think what it means is that, is that the assessment of where there are challenges, either in terms of impacts directly on the natural heritage or, say, on access, mm. that those are scoped right at the beginning. So if there's a way of designing around them, um, or there's a way of mitigating or a way of offsetting, then, then that's part of the project from the beginning. It's not a, a bit that's tacked on later on when you discover a problem. Um, and I think if we, if we take on the, you know, the fourth bridge, which is you know, a major development going right across a European protected area with protected areas on both sides, that, that that enabled those issues to be bottomed out right at the beginning of the project and not delay things halfway through or, or towards the end. OK, Mark Roscoe. Just, just sticking with that A9 example, I mean, you said that you're involved at the beginning of the project, but... Is there the capacity within SNH to follow a project through to its conclusion? Because at the moment with the A9, we see controversial options being put on the table at quite a late stage that could have major implications for the natural heritage of Island Persia. And yet I don't actually see SNH in that process at all. Um, so I, I'm just so wondering where your, where your involvement starts and stops. Okay. Um well, I mean, our involvement really starts, you know, at, at the beginning when the projects are being scoped. Um, now, in terms of, of individual projects, we are reliant to an extent on, on developers maintaining a dialogue with us, but we will always try and seek that dialogue. And that's what's important to us is this, this upstream engagement, this early engagement. So you're still um, involved in the A9 project? Yeah, well, we're, we're, we're advising options. almost constantly as different, as different bits of that right. come forward. OK, that's interesting to know. OK, okay. Um, I'm going to move on to Jenny Gilruth in a moment, but Finlay Carson has a supplementary question. Thanks, Convener. Good morning. I, I think it's more or less been answered. Uh, I, I wanted to know whether you thought your structure was in place to, to be a delivery partner for some of the other portfolios to actually achieve their priorities, but I, I think uh, we've explored that and you, you've answered the question on that. Okay, thanks. Jenny Goldruth, I think, wants to tease out some education-related questions. Thank you, Convener. Um, yeah, just to drill down a wee bit, we've looked at health and we've looked at planning in terms of, you know, looking across portfolios with regard to funding. So 
Uh, with regard to education, um, Mr Ross, you spoke about various different initiatives in education. You'll know at the moment it's a, a government priority in terms of closing the attainment gap. Uh, there's also been um, quite a lot of discussion in terms of mental health uh, in schools and how we talk about mental health in schools and how children are taught to deal with their social and mental well-being. And I think there's an agenda there in terms of access to quality uh, green space within uh, an education environment. And if you've been in any of our secondary schools, you, you may or may not agree with that statement. Um, so head teachers are now to receive funding directly from the government um, as part of the attainment plans um, in terms of closing the gap. So I just wondered to what extent SNH will seek to feed into that agenda in terms of preventative spend. Um, have you had any thoughts around about that? And in terms of those specific initiatives with regard to education, are you able to give any examples? Well, I can certainly give you some um, ongoing examples. I think the one I would probably highlight is the, the learning in local green space, mm -hmm. which is um, a, a project. And I think it's, the current aim is to, to help about 100 schools. And certainly I was actually down in Ayrshire at a, an event in the last two or three weeks, and that was being cited as, as some of the examples of ongoing work there. And the focus there is on the most dis disadvantaged areas. So to some extent, there's, I think there's an important uh, match. And it's about... I suppose getting pupils um, uh, uh, to encourage them to you know, use the outdoors as part of the learning mm -hmm. experience and do this on a regular basis. That's something that's already there, it's up and running and it's operating and it's uh, building up, uh, I think, quite a significant uh, uh, momentum. Uh, we also have an initiative called Teaching uh, in Nature um, uh, and that's been running, I think, since 2012. And we've also done a, a number of initiatives uh, linked to other agencies. And you'll probably be aware of things like forest schools. And certainly yeah. that's made a very significant uh, impact in some areas in terms of people who perhaps had become disconnected with the traditional school experience, but found that they could reconnect in, in, a, in a, let's say, in a more green environment mm -hmm. and it could actually help them move on. So, yes, we have been involved in, in a number of such initiatives around Scotland, working with partners and others. And, in, and going forward in terms of that agenda with regard to closing the attainment gap, has SNH fed into that agenda at all or does it plan to? Well, I, I think uh, at the moment I, I, some of my colleagues might know whether we've actually fed into it at the present time. I think I would say that a number of these initiatives clearly are in sympathy with it and whether we have mm -hmm. explicitly fed into it, I don't know at present, but I would think that would be an obvious extension in terms of the work that yeah. we do. Can I ask how you, you, you raise awareness of some of that work that you do? Because I, I attended a biodiversity, Tayside Biodiversity yeah. event a few weeks ago, which was very good, by the way. But I was quite struck by the number of projects that were being carried out across Tayside. I had no knowledge of them. That's maybe a criticism of myself. But given my interest in the subject, I'm a little bit surprised that it hadn't come across my radar. So what do you, what do, you do to raise awareness of the good work you're doing out there in communities? Because that's surely part and parcel encouraging respect for the natural environment that would spread out across society. Well, you know, I'm very happy to say that I think one of the real strengths we've got is the quality of our people, their commitment, their professionalism, mm -hmm. their absolute dedication. And it's, I mean, I've worked with a range of agencies and I've seen that, but I've never seen it to the extent that I do in s &H. I mean, they really are committed to what they do and uh, go well beyond you know, what would normally be expected. Mm -hmm. If I was going to make one criticism of s &H, we're not good at telling people what we do. Um, certainly one of my aims is we can become better at it. There's a whole range of initiatives, some of them we've described today, a whole range of others that we haven't, that SNH either lead, participate on, or facilitate or enable. And we're not good at getting that message out. You know, many people, when they think of SNH, think that it's something to do with protected areas, and that's about it. And there's such a range of activities that we're involved in, and it, you know, it's right at the core of our role, and it's about making things happen, and it's that connection between you know, nature and people. So you know, one of the things that certainly I've highlighted as a priority, and, it's, and I think it is uh, it's beginning to gather a bit of momentum, but it's far from that, is about community, communicating what we do to stakeholders, and to the wider public, but we have more to do in that respect. I, I was at the local biodiversity action um, plan um, uh, reception in Parliament just about a week ago, and I think it was very gratifying there that when you actually had people who are directly involved time and time again, they highlighted things that had happened because of S&H. And, &H. and uh, you know, I think we probably are a little bit shy about actually claiming the credit, and I think there's a lot of credit that we can justifiably claim. Okay. Well, talking about people, uh, Maurice Golden's got some questions. Uh, yeah, just uh, looking at uh, staffing levels, and I've looked across uh, the 
the portfolio in terms of other agencies as well and staff to budget ratios. And uh, my reckoning is that SNH is probably around about mid-table. So there's some agencies that operate with around half the amount of staff uh, per uh, pound of budget spent and others who operate uh, around uh, double uh, your staffing levels. Now, in part, this reflects slightly different functions being carried out, but I think it also could reflect on different approaches to how you spend your allocated budget. And I, I'd be interested to hear a little bit uh, about that in terms of uh, what your delivery approach is, how much you uh, utilise contracting out uh, for uh, uh, delivering various functions, and secondly, uh, how any changes in staffing uh, profiles have been reflected in delivering uh, the functions and the uh, uh, national performance in indicators over the past five years, both in terms of total numbers and uh, particular areas of focus? Um, I, I suspect I'll probably look at my colleagues to go into the detail of that. I think the general comment I would make is that in terms of, of delivery, we still value the fact that we have a dispersed presence across Scotland. You know, we have, I think, 38 offices across Scotland, many of them shared premises now in terms of the approach we're taking, but it means that we still have that level of operational contact with stakeholders and the member of the pub and members of the public. But we also do make use of trying to get to create a number of teams so we can have sort of centres of expertise, not necessarily located in one place. In fact, the term we often use is virtual teams, where they are a team, but they're a team located in, in, in different areas. So we've tried to sort of work to the strengths of our organisation, but retaining some of those benefits. But in terms of some of the more detailed points you raised, now that I've, I've given my colleagues some time to reflect, <laughs> I'll now uh, look across to, to Ian and Jane. Okay, well, I might ask Jane to say something specifically on, on the extent of contracting out. Um, I mean, the, on the, the general issue, I think, you know, you, the key point is, as, as you set out, it's, it's, it's this balance between things you need people to deliver and things you could deliver in other ways um, if you chose to do so. Um, SNH as an organisation, it has a sort of um, a great benefit but also a great challenge in that we have very wide legislation. We have, we have powers to do lots and lots of different things. So we're always... Um, we're always blessed with a great variety of things we could do, uh, and therefore with difficult decisions about which ones you do do. But we have a whole, we have a set of statutory responsibilities which must be prioritised. These are things we are legally obliged to do, and a lot of those are about advice. So essentially, we're a knowledge-based organisation. So it's about our role in the planning system, our role in the protected area system, which which is about people. So that tends to make it harder to reduce staffing numbers um, because you can only deliver those things with people in the expertise that you need to do. So that said, we have reduced our staffing numbers by about 148 over um, that a six-year period now. The way we've done that really is, is to identify areas which we're going to protect and reduce everything else. Mm -hmm. um, so essentially, we have protected certain areas, um, for example, marine has been protected for a lot of that period because there was an increase in the work on marine protected areas, marine planning. So we would protect that area, which meant that other areas were vulnerable um, to, to cuts and vacancies. We've and what also were those areas that, that were vulnerable and you had to cut? So some of the, the terrestrial areas, areas like earth sciences, Okay. Um, we've seen a, a reduction in staff. I think we have fewer ornithologists. So there's been a pressure on on those areas of expertise, which were not specifically protected. So marine ornithologists were in a better position, shall we say, because of uh, uh, the priority on marine. Um, so we've approached it in that way. We've also looked at obviously the core functions, the the things like IT, uh, finance. Um, there is a difficulty because there's a core there beyond which you're taking risks. Mm -hmm. um, and, and particularly, I think the, you'll be familiar with the work of Digital Scotland. And I think there, there is an issue as to how public bodies are able to scale down their investment in IT if we can share more, because that's been difficult for us to reduce. So although we didn't specifically protect it, we found it hard to, to reduce. 
Uh, but as I say, we've protected some areas. I think the committee is, may have seen from, from parliamentary questions that uh, we've also protected a lot of the deer work, again, because of the priority that was placed on that. Um, so it, it, it's worked that way around. Mm -hmm. And about contracting out, how, how does that function? Um, I think we, I would have to get some further detail provided to you. After. I don't have specifics in terms of the contracting out information. We'll, we'll, su we'll, yeah. we'll, we'll supply yeah. that information, yeah. Mr. Gould. Thank you. If you could do that. And, a, and as quickly as you possibly yep. can, yeah. because you know, this is a constrained process. Um, just uh, Claudia Beamish, I think, was a supplementary. Thank you, Convener. I, I'm a bit perplexed by uh, the comments about how what is and isn't protected. Um, and, and I'm not in any way wanting to put words in anyone's mouth. You're here to give evidence to us. But my understanding is that there are terrestrial protections which are equally robust as marine protections. But is it possible that because the marine protections are new, there are additional pr budgetary pressures? Um, and therefore, that is the reason for the shift. Because I would be concerned if the we're coming to the terrestrial uh, protections later in, in the discussions, but I would be concerned if, if there was that shift away from terrestrial. Sorry, Sorry. It, yeah, no, it is, it is about what, what's the pro what are the priorities at the moment? And obviously because there has been this um, program of identifying new marine protected areas, they are themselves novel. So um, there was a lot of work to be done in terms of survey, in terms of scoping, in terms of management, in terms of identification. So it was really that that, that had to be um, protected because it was a new area of work and there was a lot of new things to be done. So it was harder, well, it was harder to cut it, but also it was more important to invest in it now while that work was ongoing. In time, that balance may change back again. It will depend on the priorities. Mark Roscoe. Have there been new responsibilities that SNH has taken on in the last year, for example, around licensing? And when that does happen, is the discussion with government around, well, okay, you have to meet this, you know, you have to deliver this new responsibility within the terms of your existing budget, or actually, you know, do you get into negotiations around what additional resource you need to perform those functions? I mean, the, I mean the, there are two examples potentially coming up where the reports that you produce on beavers and deer may potentially lead to a greater work requirement on the part of SNH. So, you know, how, how are you placed, I think as Mark Russell's touching upon there, what resource-wise and how fleet of foot are you to respond to, to new challenges like this? Well, as you can probably guess, it's very difficult for me to say much about deer or, or, or uh, beaver at the present time. I think we just have to wait and see. Uh, what, how that develops and um, await ministerial decisions. But they are examples of something they, they that could are, generate a situation I, I can, for you. I would cite another example. I mean, as you're probably aware, the Joint Nature Conservation Committee have recently had a review led by um, DEFRA and the, uh, you know, the, the, the countryside administrations. And you know, we will be taking on some additional responsibilities there. It's, it's, it's quite small, but it's an example of it. And, uh, there will need to be um, a degree of some form of resource transfer to, to support that. Uh, so that would be normally part of the discussion that's taken place. You, you specifically uh, mentioned um, licensing. I mean, we do have, a, I think, a very robust uh, service-focused uh, licensing uh, group in place within SNH, and, I, I, and certainly that was subject to, I think, a review that we did a, probably a year or two ago um, and, and I think that you know was a, a very sort of positive development in terms of how they take things forward. And I think they're you know they're they're well placed to to manage their existing load and perhaps uh, look at any additional responsibilities. Okay. Looking at the, the the issue about priorities and what what can be cut, what might be cut, in evidence that the committee received last week around biodiversity, it was suggested to us that SNH has either taken the decision to pull out of or is considering a decision to withdraw from attending the Moy Game Fair, the Dundee Food and Flower Festival, the Scottish Game Fair, and perhaps most significantly of all, the Royal Highland Show. Um, is there any truth in that? And if so, how would that square with your stated determination to raise awareness of what SNH does amongst a wider audience? Uh, well, certainly, uh, um, 
uh, our intention would be to continue to participate in the Highland Show and the, the Scoon Game Fair, and we've done that for a number of years. Um, the only one that I'm aware of where there was a change is that we did not actually have a physical tent presence at the Moy Game Fair. Uh, we still had staff at the Moy Game Fair. Um, I, as, uh, as, a, uh, as part of my own role, make a point of actually attending all, the, all of those, although I did not make it to the Moy Game Fair, purely because I managed to injure my leg the week before and couldn't walk. So that was my excuse. But certainly it would be my intention, as long as I am chairman, that I would be attending all of those main events. Um, in terms of the, the Dundee one, I'm not cited on it. Uh, there are a, a number of smaller local events which in effect are taken forward by operational staff and there are some that we attend, there are some we do not, so I can't comment on that. Um, but no, the only one that I'm aware of where we did not actually have a, a stand as such was at the Moy Game Fair and that was the first year that we didn't have it and yes, I think that, that would have been a, a budget decision but we made sure that staff were there and staff circulated and as I say, under normal circumstances, the chairman would be there as well, and that will be the intention in the future. Those are important events, and particularly the Highland Show and, and, and uh, the Scoon Game Fair. It's good that you had the opportunity to clear that up yeah. after the suggestion we had last week. Uh, Mark Ruskell, do you want to come in on this? Um, yeah, I mean, th there's a wider question here about, you know, if, if SNH is withdrawing um, staff and services in particular areas, and we, you know, we touched on planning, for example, earlier on, um, what, what kind of impact there is on other organisations? I mean, if you're spending, for example, less time doing educational outreach or less time supporting the assessment of planning applications, isn't that just transferring pressure to other organisations? And what kind of discussions do you have with those organisations uh, about that? Who, who kind of fills the gap, if you like, if you're protecting some areas of, of your service, withdrawing or reducing others? I wonder if I could just <clears throat> maybe clarify the position in terms of planning. Um, I think it's a change of approach. I think I would challenge uh, the comment that we withdrawn. Uh, what we have tended to do now is that we um, seek to actually influence you know, the, the planning process, whether it's local development plans, whether it's supplementary planning guidance, whether it's, um, in effect, strategic plans. And the idea is that um, natural heritage, landscape and access issues are embedded within that planning process. Uh, where we actually get directly involved in terms of casework tends to be where there is a national designation, but we still have a significant involvement in terms of planning and consenting authorities and influence in their policy development. I attended the unit meeting of our planning and renewables group last week, and um, there was updates given, and there were examples of, for instance, where one of our officers had been on a long-term secondment working and supporting the development of the strategic plan for the Lothians. And that was a significant commitment of time. And we also have officers who are uh, part of their time is involved with supporting local authorities when they're reviewing development plans. That's an example of upstream involvement. So I actually would challenge that we're withdrawing. What we're doing is we're getting involved in a different way. And I give a talk to the heads of planning conference about a year and a half ago, and it was on this upstream involvement. And I, I sought sort of their feedback in terms of they, did they feel that this was working? And I was given a very positive response on the heads of planning conference about that approach and the effectiveness of it. So that's very much, you see your role as commenting at a strategic level now in terms of planning, but not at individual application process. Uh, not, not, for example, in, in appeals or public inquiries. That, that's not really your role anymore. At least, I mean, it's interesting. Um, again, you know, I've got the information directly from the people most involved. No, we actually have not been involved in many appeals in the last few months but we will be involved in four appeals in the near future. It depends on the nature of the casework. So yes, we still are involved, but what, where we do get involved in individual casework tends to be where there is a development that links into a national designation. You know, it could be an SAC, an SPA, an, a, a significant SSSI, or a national scenic area. Uh, so we still are involved. Again, I, I look, I don't know if the Chief Executive has anything he wishes to add. Um, no, I think that's right. I think, I, th I think it has been more a process of making sure that we use our resources uh, better. And we have reviewed this with other, we manage it through a thing called casework management system, and we've reviewed that to make sure that staff are prioritising their time um, on the things that matter, on the on most important cases, the one most likely to have, have an influence. I think the key thing for us, though, is, is our approach does depend on 
the government's plan-led approach. Because uh, if we can put our resources into influencing the plan, then we put less resources into influencing individual decisions because they should follow from the plan. And that's, that's the approach we've been following. Um, but obviously, it, it does rely on, on maintaining a plan-led approach um, in the first place. Okay. Right, let's move on to an area that we've covered to some extent so far, but we need to drill down further. Uh, Finlay Carson. Um, we've seen written evidence from uh, Pass for All that's shown that demand for support from local communities for uh, PATH projects far outweighs the, the funding that's available. And on that, can I ask... Uh, whether improving access and increasing uh, access to the outdoors directly corresponds with uh, enabling a, a greater understanding of, of nature? I, I think the simple answer is yes, and that's one of the reasons that I would say that it is a priority. And you know, I would highlight um, you know, our commitment in terms of past networks across central Scotland, the leadership that we, we give to the development of the uh, John Muir Way and sort of further work around that. Um, it's very important, I think, particularly in built-up and deprived areas, but it's important for Scotland as a whole, and that's the reason why we were an active partner in the Hebridean Way, which is, well, I think the, the cycleway is in place, and they're just about to complete uh, the walkway from, you know, the full length of the Western Isles. Um, if, if you were to say, you know, would we welcome more resources to do more, the answer would be yes. But in terms of our medium to long-term uh, ambition, it very much is there, and it reflects exactly what... Uh, you've said, you know, it, it is that if you can get people to be more active, if they've got uh, pathways that are, are and cycleways that are, are close to where they live and they can be encouraged to use those, then it can make an enormous difference in terms of, um, you know, their, their quality of life. And that's where we also work with uh, agencies like Scottish Canals and make use of the canal network. And, um, you know, that has been supported and, you know, there, is a, there, is, there are ambition policies, ambitious policies and strategies in place. And on the back of that, how do you uh, make the funding decisions and prioritise uh, projects uh, in relation to, to more access? Uh, you know, you, you, we've talked and, and you've, you've mentioned deprived areas and whatever. Is that uh, an attainment gap with education or whatever? How do you actually prioritise these projects in terms of outcomes? Um, well, in terms of the, the detail of, of, of projects, clearly, you know, officers have an approach there based on, uh, you know, an, an assessment of how it matches against, um, well, government and our own priorities. And certainly the ones that I'm more familiar with, uh, for instance, are things like the Green Infrastructure Fund, which has an access element in it. And, you know, within that, you know, the deprivation is part of the consideration, though it's actually more complicated than that. I mean, I, I, I don't have um, sort of the, you know, the, the, the detailed pro forma in front of me, but I'm sure we can, well, if, unless the chief executive is able to give you more detail, we'll certainly arrange for you to, to see what the criteria are so you can have a better understanding of that. Yeah, I think, I think at the moment there are two key things um, that prioritisation is based on. One is um, the issue around equality of opportunity, which is the prioritisation on particularly um, areas of, of urban deprivation or the urban fringe. So it's around green infrastructure, it's around the work with Scottish Canals, it's around the, the Seven Locks project in Easterhouse. The second area is around the National Walking and Cycling Network, which is to say this is a national network, therefore a national agency should uh, be the one who's, who's leading this. Um, and that's primarily around not just access opportunities, but it's also around um, that as an economic asset to Scotland, particularly in terms of tourism. So it's mainly those two things. In local path networks, it's around areas of deprivation, health inequalities, and nationally, it's around a national network about tourism opportunities, about supporting um, local economies. Finally, convener, thank you. Uh, on, on the back of everything you've said, uh, how much has SNH levered uh, other funding streams uh, relating to improved access and increased use of the outdoors, where it ticks the boxes for the priorities for other organisations or, or, or other groups? So, for example, going back to health and social care integration, they've got priorities that potentially SNH could deliver those priorities. Uh, how, have, how have you gone about trying to lever, uh, leverage funding from these other uh, 
bodies. Maybe I, if I could cite one example, and it's just going to have the information at hand, and that's one of the Green Infrastructure Fund projects. This is the Canal and North Gateway project, which is around sort of Postle Park in, in, in Glasgow. So that was about 7.59 million. 1.63 came from ERDF. In terms of the March funding, that was City Deal, Vacant and Derelict Land Funds, Regeneration Capital Grant, Sustrans, the Green Exercise Partnership, and Esme Fairburn. And also there was a contribution in terms of land and other things involving Scottish canals, and the City Council were involved and that linked into projects they were taking forward. So, you know, that gives you the sort of the spread to try and... As a, and I just cite that as an example in terms of, I suppose, how complicated it is, but also the, you know, the range of sources, whether it's charitable and public and, and, and other, that actually allow the project to go ahead. OK, thank you. Um, Emma Harper has a line of question. OK, thank you, convener. Um, it's uh, information about the underspend. The SNH annual report and accounts in 2015-16 stated that there are, there's no end-year flexibility to retain reserves or overspend and manage the underspend to within 1%. So for 2015-16, the net underspend was more than the approved underspend. I've got the figures here, but uh, I'm wondering if you can help me understand the reasons behind the underspend and uh, what activities were impacted. Well, um, I'll, say I'll leave it to colleagues to go into the detail, but I, I, I do know that that was based on managed agreement with our sponsor and considerable discussion, but I look to Dean and Jane who will answer the specifics of that. Uh, yeah, um, we were asked to consider any uncommitted funds in year as part of um, Scottish Government reconsideration of in-year budget pressures last year, so um, there was an agreed approach and that was what was reflected in our annual accounts. Okay. Yeah. I just we were more at it. Yes, the, the annuality is, is the interest in issue in that we, we can't carry over any funding, so you have to try and bring the budget in but you can't overspend. So it means you almost always underspend, and the challenge is how small can you get that underspend? Uh, and that, that's what we try to do every, every year. The challenge for SNH is because a lot of, a lot of our project spend is with partners. So it, it's quite difficult because you're not just bringing your own budget in, they've got to bring their budgets in as well. So SNH almost a, always ends up with some underspend. But as, as Jane said last year, there was also an agreement with Scottish Government that we should seek, uh, seek to underspend if, effectively in order to free up funds for other things. Were there activities that were impacted then by the underspend? I'm, I'm, I'm not aware that there were. I mean, it was done in a planned way, and it was, and um, you know, it's not something that just materialised. You know, it was, it was, and but I can't think of any specifics. Um, there may have been some areas that were postponed till the next year, but I don't think there were any major issues. No, it is a mixture, um, and it, it's basically those. Um, I, w I wasn't in, in post at the time it happened, so Jane may want to correct me. But essentially, at, at, at one point in the financial year, we were asked not to make any further commitments. So it was a little bit of anything that wasn't committed at that stage was, was not committed, and that's where the underspend came from. So it's a mixture, but it, it, is, it is essentially on the project side. So if you, if you think of SNH as part of the money is about staff and is about delivering advice and all the rest of it, and part is about paying other people funding things, funding projects. It was that side that contributed to the underspend. Um, I mean, we could give you um, some more information on that, but the short answer is it's a real mixture of, of projects. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Let's wrap this up by looking at biodiversity in general. Uh, Mark Roskell. Yeah, thanks, convener. We can turn to uh, protected areas. Um, I mean, the committee has received some concerns um, that there may be a reduction of funding for protected areas, particularly in terms of you know, maintenance and enhancement of habitat condition, and what the impact of this might be on our ability to meet those important international HE targets. As you know, we're chasing 15% you know, restoration of degraded ecosystems by, by 2020, and there are obviously some big issues in there around non-native invasive species that we've already you know, discussed this morning. Um, what, what's your view on the, on, the, on the nature of that risk and the concerns that, 
that are being raised uh, to this committee. Maybe just a, a few general points. I think, I think something that we do need to celebrate is in terms of our own protected areas, we actually achieved the 80% favourable condition target this year, and I think that's no mean feat. So I think that reflects uh, a great deal of good work by our people and a range of, of other organisations. Doesn't that depend on how you define favourable condition? Um, yes, it, it does. Uh, but I think it, we make it very clear what that definition is. And yes, it does include areas which are now uh, under management and moving towards favourable condition. I think you've also got to recognise that some sites, um, certainly some degraded sites, uh, once you initiate management operations are not going to change overnight. It could actually be some years, but that's just the nature of the, I suppose, the ecology and the site. But the important thing is that the commitment is made and they are moving forward and that has been part of the assessment. Um, uh, in terms of, of uh, uh, other contributions, I think to note is that in, as far as the, um, you know, the biodiversity route map, we give a, the first of our yearly reports um, just in the last uh, couple of months, and I think it highlighted, um, I think, some significant positive progress in terms of a, a, a number of sort of big six areas of work. Uh, it also highlighted, I think, where some further work is required, I think particularly around uh, native woodlands. And um, sometime, hopefully early next year, we'll actually have completed and um, uh, submitted our three yearly report on the Scottish diversity strategy. And I think that's probably going to be the most significant uh, document because that's when you will sort of assess how things have progressed against the, you know, the biodiversity criteria that are in place in terms of performance. So I think the intention is that that should be in front of Parliament sometime, hopefully reasonably early next year. And I've no doubt that this committee will have some significant uh, interest in that. And I think that's the point at which we will be in a, a better position to judge uh, progress. Will that report actually look at the budget issues? I mean, if you have a declining budget for protected species, I, I don't understand how you're going to improve that ecological condition unless there's a, a sort of trick that I'm missing here. Well, I mean, it will look against the agreed criteria you know, that, that are in place in terms of you know, Scottish biodiversity. So to some extent, yes, I suppose you could argue it will reflect or be a consequence of a, a range of influences. And, you know, part of that will be, um, a, a will be resourcing because it will be a measure of success. I think my recollection is that, you know, most of the criteria are sort of scientific based and there's a small number that are around issues uh, in terms of engagement. Again, I think there's something around about 20, 22 areas. I mean, I'm, it's not something I've, a, I've got an immediate recall on. But that's some, that, I think that will be the significant document. And I think that will be, you know, based on a, a three-year report. A significant document um, take on board <coughs> a, a criticism that was made in front of this committee last week, that there are perhaps too many strategies and they don't obviously mesh. It could, because if that's a valid criticism, there's always a waste of financial resource somewhere yeah. in there. Is that something that you'll look at? Well, I mean, I think, there's, I think there's good progress being made in that direction. I think that's a criticism that would probably be more justified a, a few years ago where there were a number of strategies and they were not necessarily as well aligned as they might be. Um, I, I think we're not necessarily absolutely there yet, but I think you know, we've now got a system, we have a, a land use strategy. I think the intention is clearly that as new strategies come along, they will be aligned and reflect that. And also, you know, critically, you, know, you will take that uh, more of an integrated approach in terms of... Uh, what, what, you, um, what you measure and what you take forward, and clearly the Scottish biodiversity strategy will, will link into that. Okay. Claudia Beamish, do you want to come in? Yeah, just uh, briefly, thank you, convener. I'd like to, um, in relation to biodiversity, uh, uh, which Mark o opened up uh, for us all, um, could I ask you about the National Ecological Network? And in their written submission, Scottish Wildlife Trust um, expressed concerns about a, a possible lack of leadership, and I'm not saying necessarily that is SNH's responsibility uh, at a national level, because um, we, we often get um, very good comment about the Central Scotland Green Network, but how that actually um, connects up uh, for, to develop the National Eco um, Ecological Network, um, I have some concerns about, and I'm wondering if you can let us know about progress on that and whether there, obviously there are budgetary pressures, but how, how that's developing. Well, I, I think it, it's referenced, I think, within the national planning policy framework. Yes. I, I think the, the approach that we've taken, and again, it's a collaborative approach, particularly in terms of central Scotland, 
Uh, and I think our main leadership has been through um, the Coco Life project, which I think has, has managed to drive a number of things forward. Um, also, we've uh, clearly made use of a number of initiatives which I've already made mention of. Um, so I don't, I, don't, I don't necessarily agree with that. Um, I think what we, if, if, unless my colleagues want to add something, I think what we can do is probably give you a greater visibility in terms of what we have done, particularly through the, with partners in terms of the Ucoco Life project. Um, I don't know, Ian, is there anything that you want, Can want I to just say b b before you come in, in what is uh, particularly uh, or could be of concern, which I'd appreciate a response to, is, yes, um, Central Scotland Green Network, um, very exciting, all sorts of things happening, and I know personally about that, but some of it happens to be in my region. But how is, how is that progressing as a national um, uh, strategy uh, for, for the Green Network more widely, and what are there budgetary pressures which mean that bits of it are not getting developed at all? Or, um, you know, it would be interesting to know. Well, I, I was aware of the comments I think that had been made. Uh, I think the Scottish Wildlife Trust, I didn't yes. necessarily immediately uh, recognise them, but Ian, I think you were about to come in. Um, yeah, no, I, I, I think there's a fairly long standing issue about what is the National Ecological Network, and I think, to be honest, that isn't. Bottomed out yet? Okay. Um, and it's been I think, there for quite a long time, hasn't it? Yeah, so good but if I, that could I, get I think it's one out. of these things that that, that it, it sounds lovely, but what what, it, what exactly does it look like? Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't think we're there yet. And we have asked the NGOs um, to help by by presenting their view of of what a, a national ecological network would look like. I mean, in the meantime, I don't. Don't think we'd be, it, it's, it would be fair to say we haven't done anything because I think there are building blocks of what could be a national mm -hmm. ecological network out there, and we don't think it's something like the Dutch model where you have lines on maps, um, because we have a different set, position in Scotland. We have large areas of semi-natural um, habitat left in Scotland, and therefore the issues of connectivity and joining up are not what they are in other parts of Europe. And, and it would be artificial, in a way, I think, to, to start to do that. But where we do have an issue, and therefore where we've concentrated, is the central belt. That's where we have the issues about habitat connectivity, um, um, habitats being broken up by infrastructure, by development. So, um, as Ian said, the, the focus has more been on the central belt, the Central Scotland Green Network, the, the LIFE project, to look at how would you best join up. And I would think from that, we'd be better able to say, well, what does that mean on, the, on a Scotland-wide uh, basis? That's um, helpful. So Is there any timeline on, on those discussions? Uh, Just so that if, if everybody, not everybody, but if most people knew what it was they were working towards, that would uh, probably be very helpful. I, I don't think there is a timeline at the right. moment, but I'm, I'm happy to take away the message that we should. Right. Thank you. And you could perhaps keep us updated as a committee as that work progresses. It would be useful to have that information, as it would uh, quite a number of pieces of follow-up information that we've discussed today that you've undertaken to provide. I uh, appreciate the demands on your time, but if that could be uh, given to us timelessly as is reasonable and achievable, that would be appreciated. Um, otherwise, can I thank you for your attendance today? And uh, I'll suspend the meeting for a short period of time to facilitate the changeover of witnesses. Thank you.
Uh, welcome back to this meeting of the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee. We continue our discussions on the Scottish Government's draft budget 2017-18 and we are joined by representatives of Marine Scotland now. We have Linda Rosborough, the Director, Mike Palmer, Deputy Director of Performance, Aquaculture and Recreational Fisheries and Anna Donald, Head of Marine Planning and Strategy. Welcome to you all. Um, begin with just looking at the general uh, picture. I think. Um, given the direction of travel, it's unlikely you're going to see a budget increase for the forthcoming year. So I'm just wondering what work has gone on to date or is going on currently to identify areas of potential saving that may need to be activated once you get that budget figure. Um, thank you, Convener. Um, obviously, this is a, a live issue for us. Um, we have been established as an organisation bringing together um, separate agencies at a time when resources have continued to be challenging. Mm -hmm. And so we've been in a, in a, in a journey looking for um, more effective ways of working, um, bringing together resources from one purpose to use for another purpose, um, seeking more flexibilities and driving out efficiencies over the last few years. So. Um, that is very much part of the, the picture going forward as well. Um, in addition, ensuring that we can um, secure income generation where possible, and a strategy whereby we um, are looking to set agendas which we can then work on in partnership with others rather than doing everything at our own hand. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's been a particularly significant way in which we've approached um, the um, underpinnings of offshore energy, where um, we've worked a lot with partners and where we've secured significant research resources coming in. And beyond that, good housekeeping. Um, we continue to um, invest in improving our um, approaches. For example, we have successfully introduced um, electronic logbooks as the basis for how uh, fisheries management um, applies across the, the fishing fleet. Um, and that has enabled us to reduce quite significantly our spend on administrative staff. Um, and then we've managed that by, um, while the staff have been distributed across our coastal offices, we've, we've um, reduced work in, in, in Edinburgh and sort of farmed work out so that we can um, keep folk where, the, where they are um, and, and, and manage within the, um, the limited flexibilities that we have around staffing. So, so how would staffing numbers currently compare with, say, two years ago? Um, we're, I think we're, it, it always depends on what you count, but we're at um, 628 sort of permanent staff um, when we were formed, we were 765, so that's quite a substantial reduction over the years. Uh, and, and, and we've got a sort of modest reduction recently. And how does that impact on the priorities of Marine Scotland? You know, presume we have to be very careful where you make those cuts uh, to, to protect the the, the areas of uh, statutory duties and, uh, and the other things that can come along unexpected with new responsibilities or whatever. Indeed. Um, a big part of our role, um, a big part of our essential capability is our fleet. We operate five vessels. Um, those operate on a sort of three week on, three week off basis, so they have two crews. So there's a fairly substantial um, resource um, demand associated with those vessels. Um, that is core to our ability both to police the sea and to do the um, essential data collection um, required to underpin the scientific process of stock assessment. And we um, are restricted in manning levels. There are statutory restraints on, on, on posts and, and skills. So a big challenge that we've had is maintaining that capability as um, public sector pay has has been um, frozen. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Let's uh, move on and look at marine conservation orders. Uh, Emma Harper. Thank you, Convener. 
Um, as previously noticed, Marine Scotland, uh, noted Marine Scotland has implemented a network of marine protection areas and associated fisheries management measures. Um, I'm wondering how much Marine Scotland has spent annually on marine protection area development and implementation, and whether they have adequate resources for their maintenance. Okay, um, that's the sort of complicated elements to that. I sort of mentioned our core capability, and one of the um, advantages of the establishment of Marine Scotland was the ability to use that core capability in different ways. Um, the investment is there in, in, in the vessels, and therefore, um, for example, whereas voyages of one of our research vessels might in the past have been solely for fish stock assessments, now generally um, a voyage would also be collecting environmental data, we might be monitoring a, a, an MPA as, as part of that planned voyage so that you're ensuring that your assets are used as, as, as effectively as possible. Equally well, um, the Marine Act brought into effect that our compliance staff have powers in relation to compliance on the new provisions bringing in marine conservation orders, as well as the fishery officer role that they had previously. So we're able to use our flexible resource um, and our vessel monitoring systems and our um, um, shore-based capability um, and our intelligence gathering systems and risk-based approach to, to, to monitoring and applying that to the um, compliance needs of marine protected areas. Um, uh, we're not standing still on that one. We're also you know, looking ahead to, to, to new technologies and, and um, um, ensuring that we're sort of thinking for the future of, of future developments as well. Okay. Um, I'm also curious about the extent to which the success of the Marine Protection Area Network is reliant on collaborative working i.e. with local authorities or other stakeholders like inshore fisheries or marine tourism, um, and how budgetary restrictions might impact on these. Bringing up at that point the experience in the last, towards the end of the last parliament where the development of one particular MPA became very resource intensive because I think some of the stakeholders would argue because of the approach that was taken by Marine Scotland, fairly or unfairly, what did you learn from that experience in terms of moving forward to develop the other MPAs about how it could, might be done more efficiently? Whilst appreciating entirely that you have to come from an evidence-based standpoint. Yes, I, I, I think um, um, the uh, example is, 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 is well recalled. Um, <laughs> By all of us who were involved. Um, we were all involved. So um, I think there are very strong views on both sides. And I think that is actually... Um, it is part of operating in this space that that sometimes that is how things are. And I think Mr Lockhead spoke quite eloquently about some of the challenges around that. Mm -hmm. um, we certainly um, do and, and did in, in that example spend a lot of time and resource in engaging with stakeholders directly and in um, ensuring that there was good evidence collected. Um, since the conservation orders have come into effect, um, although there were a few con initial c concerns, um, generally compliance has, has been good. Um, I think there are still strong views on, on, on all sides. Mm. Um, and I think um, you know, there is still a need to um, um, improve relationships going further forward and create a forward-looking positive vision of, of um, marine management that people can, can buy into. So I think there's still some unfinished work there. Mm -hmm. um, we do have the Clyde Marine Planning Partnership in, in, in inception. We do have an inshore fisheries group and, and links between those are, are being encouraged. Um, so um, our we, we also have the work that Mr Lockett announced around um, monitoring both on socioeconomics and the monitoring framework from the environmental point of view. And that's been taken forward and there will be reports due on that um, early in the new year, which I'm sure the committee will have an interest in. So all that is actively building an evidence layer that I think will help all sides to move forward. I don't know if Anna wants to come in specifically on the um, connections with marine planning. 
Um, just to pick up on a, a few of those things, um, as Linda mentioned, we've got the sort of Clyde Marine Planning Partnership um, in its kind of emerging stages at the moment. It doesn't have the formal role yet, but the partnership is there and the Insure Fisheries Group is part of that partnership. Um, so potentially in the future, there will be that more kind of locally based forum for these issues to be discussed mm -hmm. as well as between ourselves and the kind of very local interests. Um, who obviously um, I take a very vocal approach at certain stages in the process. So I think that might be one way of making things more locally based and a kind of efficient use of that local resource as well as the kind of extensive central resource that Linda was referring to that, that we are using to support those processes. Um, I think genuinely, though, as Linda was saying, because there are such <coughs> strongly held views from different perspectives on these types of issues, it is always going to be quite a resource-intensive mm. process, and it's about using the, the, the combination of local and national resource most effectively, I would say. Yeah, I just wanted to add that the other thing that we're looking <coughs> at in order to help us with the, um, the programme of monitoring and uh, in collaboration with the industry is... Um, emerging technology. Uh, so we have been trialling monitoring systems on 274 different inshore vessels under 12 metres. And these are the kinds of vessels that often operate off the west coast um, uh, that are very much affected by the MPA network developments uh, that have recently taken place. And I think one of the challenges that we have had is um, gathering comprehensive evidence base yeah, um, uh, in order to be able to assess um, the uh, different opinions and concerns that do arise from the management of MPAs. And with this kind of technology, we will have a much better map um, in real time uh, in, in due course of what exactly the, the fishing patterns are um, and where the impacts are. And that, that will help us in terms of monitoring the MPAs going forward. Okay. Uh, in terms of, of resources, um, we also have regional marine plans coming down the track. And in the last parliament, the RACI committee was concerned that there would be some of the partners in these plans, the local authorities, who wouldn't really have the expertise to take forward that work. And I think the RACI committee was looking towards Marine Scotland to be proactive in, in assisting them. Is that something resource-wise you're capable of doing? And do you see that as a role for yourselves? I'll ask Anna to take this one. Um, yes, I kind of recall the, the previous discussions. Um, so regional marine planning is certainly an area where the resources that are available to support it are kind of less than what was anticipated at the point where the Marine Scotland Act was um, going through Parliament. So progress has been um, slower in terms of rolling out those partnerships than I think was envisaged when the legislation was going through. Um, but having said that, we have got the first partnership formally uh, set up in Shetland as of March of this year, and <clears throat> we're working very closely with Clyde. Um, and that's probably quite a good case study of how we would plan to work with local authorities. Um, so in the Clyde area, you have eight separate local authorities who would come within that marine planning partnership. <clears throat> Some of them are choosing to be represented through Clyde Plan, which is... Um, the strategic planning authority that they are already engaged with um, and they feel that can give them a good joint approach to, towards feeding into the marine planning partnership um, but we have done specific work with all the local author authorities and we've also brought them together to do a lot of that work um, really just kind of information sharing at this stage about what we expect from regional marine planning what is potentially available from marine scotland by way of support in terms of data um, GIS systems, etc. Um, so yeah, we're, we've started that dialogue, and we are we've got an open door basically in terms of those local authorities coming to us <coughs> for any further information. Um, and I think that's a, a pattern we would be able to resource okay. and would be keen to, to take forward in the other areas. Um, in the other regional marine planning areas. Um, we're working quite closely with Orkney and we've had um, quite in-depth discussions with the local authority there about a potential way forward in Orkney, building on the Pentland Firth and Orkney Waters plan. 
Um, and we also continue to fund local coastal partnerships elsewhere. So in the Solway Firth, the Murray Firth, the Tay, the Firth of Forth and uh, the East Grampian coastline. Um, and local authorities, I would say, to sort of varying degrees are engaged with those local coastal partnerships. But as we move from that informal position into a statutory position, we would look to, to carry out that engagement. Um, and I think that is something that we definitely can resource from existing resources. Um, and it's, a lot of it is about bringing those local authorities together in those areas and connecting them into the other partners that mm -hmm. would form the, the partnership. Um, so the input from us is crucial, but it's, it's not actually a kind of major impact on our resources. OK, that's useful to know. Uh, Finlay Carson. Uh, convener, and with the risk of being a bit parochial, is there issues with uh, the level of funding uh, with regards to your salary requirement, for example, for electrofishing? We have a real issue, as you'll be aware, in the, the Sobe Firth uh, for uh, electrofishing for razor clams. Um, and it would appear that there, there are resources spent, but is, is there enough resources there to actually uh, prosecute those? Because the practice, which we all know is illegal at the moment, uh, continues on a daily basis. And there's very much uh, frustration that uh, this has not been stopped over the many years it's been carrying on. Is that a funding issue or, or, or why are you, are you putting resources in there, but we're not actually getting any results? Um, I think um, generally um, ensuring compliance at sea is, is, is quite challenging. The securing the evidence that you need in order to bring forward a, a, a prose prosecution is, 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 is difficult. We do use both overt and covert methods of um, following up um, instances that we're aware of. Um, and we also find that our grey ships are a strong deterrent. Um, we have three, um, three vessels, um, so um, if, if, we, if we've put them in a, in, a, in a location where we are aware of reports of, of um, um, negative activity, then, then we, we, we get an instant um, change in, in, in behaviours locally. Um, so we do have cases that we are following through. Um, it um, can be at times a bit of a cat and mouse game. Um, and yes, we have to prioritise our resources. Um, we, we have a network of 17 coastal offices. Um, we do move uh, people from, from one part of Scotland to another as, as the uh, demands change. Um, and razor clams is, is one of our top priorities at the moment in terms of um, the, the level of, um, of investment that we're making. Um, we work in close collaboration with, with the police and, and, and other agencies, not just on, on this, but on, on other inquiries as well. So there's, there's a lot going into it, but it, it is also a very challenging and uh, it's it's very easy. People just throw the evidence over the side. People hide evidence. Um, sometimes um, people can um, try and th throw smoke the other way. Um, it's 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 a challenging game. Thanks. Let's move on to marine monitoring. Uh, Claudia Beamish. Uh, thank you, Convener. Uh, just before that. Uh Good morning, if it is still morning, which is just. Could, could I just go back to the marine protected areas very briefly and ask you if there are any possibilities of formal arrangements for conflict resolution in view of um, what the convener referred to um, uh, previously about MPA challenges between stakeholders? And I'm wondering if um, through either the inshore fisheries groups or through the marine protected area management itself, whether there's any... <coughs> any possibilities for, for that formal possibility? Um, we, I, I think perhaps is the question about the future management arrangement still to be determined on Both. MPAs that don't have a management? No, M MPAs where, there are, where management is already in place and for the future a general question about if there is any, are, are any possibilities of formal conflict resolution being considered? Um, I think the answer to that is that we have mechanisms by which we workshop and work with different different people. Um, the challenge is what we try and do is find a way forward that causes the the, the least impact while still meeting the conservation objective.
perspectives. Um, the issues are often who turns up on the day, who isn't there that has an issue subsequently. Some of the challenges around that um, are what then surface later. Um, it's, it's quite a diffuse group that you can be dealing with, some of which are members of organisations, some of which are not. Um, so I'm a little bit challenged in thinking through how that would work for this particular group. I don't know if Mike wants to come in on that one. Well, really just to give an example of, of activity that we've already carried out. So um, we took part in a WWF project under the Celtic Seas Partnership, which was really focused in on finding new ways of engaging with, um, with fishing stakeholders, really. Um, and it, it so happened that that project coincided um, with a lot of the tension and concern that sparked around the, uh, the management of the MPA network. Um, so we were able to take that opportunity to actually engage in a structured set of engagements mm -hmm. um, with fishing communities in the West Coast, brokered by the WWF. And I think it was helpful to have a third party there facilitating that process. So to answer your question, in, in a sense, we've been doing a bit of that. That project is now completed, so it's not ongoing now. But I think it was very useful um, while we were undertaking it. And um, I, I took part in a number of the engagements. They were quite small scale, so you, one could be quite candid in a room with a, with a, with a, a group of fishermen mm -hmm. and um, uh, really get, get to, the, to the heart of the issues in a way that was brokered and facilitated on a professional basis by the WWF. And, and we felt that was helpful. And I know having talked to the fishermen that we engaged with that they felt it was helpful too. Thank you. Uh, more, more broadly, uh, in terms of marine monitoring and research, uh, a lot of this has been touched on already, but I would like just to read uh, a brief quote from RSPB um, highlight, highlighting concerns over the budgetary constraints, which um, many of us in the Iraqi committee had concerns about previously as well. And RSPB particularly notes that without adequate financial support for marine science and monitoring of the type that is needed to inform robust decision-making in the marine environment, Scotland's fledging marine planning system will be ineffective and the legal requirement for good environmental status, which is obviously a, a, a part of the Act, um, uh, and under the Marine um, Strategy Framework Directive, will be unachievable. Now, um, I, I, I would very much value comment on that, but I just want to put a couple of extra things into that, which are we've raised before in, in the previous session about research for um, longer term issues around climate change and uh, also biodiversity and working with partners. Um, and we would be very interested to know about the possibilities of partnership working, for instance, um, the GIS systems that the commercial interests such as oil and gas have, which came up in, again in previous committee. And just a, a bit of an update on how with budgetary cons constraints you are able to work in partnership. Yes, um, I think you've... You, a, a number of aspects to that. Yeah. Um, one, one of the issues that's, that's really important to us in, in thinking about prioritisation, about what are the things that that only government can do, or what are the things that are, are so important that, that, that need to be protected? And um, some of those issues are around um, long-term data series. So, for example, we monitor um, hydrographic um, elements in the Iceland, uh, sort of Faroese, um, Shetland Channel, and that enables, it's, it's one of the key sort of world monitoring points for ocean currents that's been hugely important in understanding of the implications of climate change and ocean current research um, and, and the, the maintenance of that um, um, data series, which we do in conjunction with the other northern countries, is, is something that is, is, is of huge importance, was starting to experiment with um, some non-vessel-based approaches of capturing some of the data, looking ahead to when technology might help to 
us to be more cost effective. But at the moment, we, we have to send the Scotia out into that far northern channel and people have to spend um, time collecting those, um, those, those samples at, at different depths and that has to be done annually. So that's the sort of effort that we hugely value. We work with international partners and it is of, of global importance in terms of climate change uh, research. Um, you mentioned also um, the oil industry and um, we, we certainly, in, in both our engagement with, with, with other industries, are trying to ensure that data that is collected by others is surfaced and, and, and mined um, so that it can be used in, in, a, in a joined up way. Um, and I mentioned already the, um, the partnership that we've had. Um, we, we set up jointly with DEC and Crown Estate OWIG Offshore Wind Industry Group, which was securing resource to enable us to understand and research some of the challenges coming from offshore wind farms so that they could be applied in the Scottish context. And we follow that through with the Scottish Pacific Group. Um, we have set up Fisheries Innovation Scotland that is bringing together um, investment from the fishing industry, from um, retail sector um, and from others to um, pool resource to look at shared priorities um, for fisheries innovation going forward. And again, that's you know, an accessible way of, of, of working in partnership. Um, in relation to the oil industry, um, the work that we've done on Marine Scotland Interactive um, has been hugely valued by them because it enables them to draw on um, publicly funded research and data collection to underpin their forward thinking and planning about how they would manage a spill incident or, or such like, and they value that. Um, and we worked with them for that um, for a couple of years. So could you comment then uh, uh, on budgetary constraints as highlighted by the RSPB? And, and in terms of, it's very interesting what you've highlighted about partnership working and, and very, very positive. But could you comment on, with the very heavy demands for, for assessment and research and science base across biodiversity, across climate change, across... Um, uh, economic interests, um, whether you feel that um, it is manageable with the present budget? I think at the moment it is manageable. I think what we're doing is innovative and, and, and genuinely groundbreaking, which means that we've been able to access European resources. Uh, the European Commission has been... Um, quite um, enthusiastic about some of the work that we've done um, and that has enabled us to draw in additional European resources in partnership with others. Um, so although our core um, has been reducing, we've been able to retain core capability and then use that to draw in additional resource. Um, we led on um, a European Marine Biological Resource Centre, which is um, a collective of significant assets for marine biology across Europe, um, and we are one of the key partners in that, and that will be a basis for future research, and that goes beyond EU members um, into other um, European partners as well. So the continued investment, which is still substantial in our core capability, enables us to lever in other resource and gives us a platform to work from, is, I think, the key answer to your question. Takes us nicely on to a line of question from David Stewart. Uh, thank you, convener. Um, Brexit has the potential to be the biggest political um, uh, earthquake in a generation. Uh, what assessment have you made of the implications of leaving the EU for your organisation, particularly around the common fisheries policy? Yes, um, it clearly. Um, depending on, on, on what happens, and obviously the Scottish Government has its, has its own views on that. Um, but where we're in a position in which we were leaving the EU, um, there would be implications. Um, the Common Fisheries Policy is, pro provides a regulatory framework at European level. Um, fishing, fisheries management is a devolved matter for this Parliament, and there would be a need um, in a future scenario for there to be a, a, a framework for the management of fisheries. We secure a lot of resource from the EU, as well as the Europe, 
European Maritime and Fisheries Fund. Um, we get direct core funding for certain functions that we do on behalf of the EU. So we receive resource for um, our contribution to the data control framework, which is the fisheries data and wider marine environmental data that we pass back to Europe. And we get about two million a year for that. And we also um, receive resource directly from European sources for joint deployments with other um, countries around fisheries compliance when we work together. Um, because stocks are shared and fishing happens in um, other countries' waters, so we work quite a lot with our partners, um, and we receive funding for that. Um, and we also receive funding for some of our IT systems associated with our needs to report back to Brussels in rela relation to quota uptake and, and fisheries management. So substantial numbers of um, implications for us as an organisation. <coughs> you may have seen the report from SAMS, part of UHI, um, which is in my region, which was um, quite negative about the effect of leaving Brexit in terms of the effect on academic research and the ability to continue to have collaborative partnerships with other European nations. Uh, whether you've seen the report or not, what's your general view on funding such as Horizon 2020? Um, Horizon 2020 has been... Um an important resource for us recently. I've mentioned how we've been gearing up in all these areas and we've been more successful than, than average in terms of our success rate on, on that, interreg as well. Um, so beyond the sort of direct funding that I mentioned, um, which would need to be secured going forward, um, there is also um, both a risk to our partnerships with others and um, wider marine science in, in Scotland. We do work closely with MASTS, which is the umbrella body for all the marine universities in, in Scotland working together. We're members of MASTS, and through that we're involved in various collaborations, so we would share that concern. And, uh, to you, Convener, RSPB gave quite an interesting note of evidence uh, to us, and they, they stressed, and you'll be familiar with this, um, that, of course, we're not out of Europe yet, um, that we still have access to structural funds, leader, uh, Life Plus, SRDP, um, and there is some arguments about UK government, the Scottish government uh, repatriating in the terrible jargon the structural funds that's there and still providing matching. I've had some evidence locally within the Highlands and Islands that there's some worries about how fast our actual structural funds are being, are being spent. But what's your general view about that point that ISPB made that uh, it ain't over yet, uh, we're still there and we should still be trying to access uh, the funds at least over the next couple of years? Um, very much agree. Um, we have, um, in fact, on the day that the referendum um, result came out, um, we got a phone call from the European Commission saying that we've been successful in a 1.6 million euro um, bid that we put forward. Um, so we're um, that that um, project will commence um, this month. Um, so um, we we certainly are very active. Um, marine energy is, is an area where we've been involved in the Ocean Energy Forum, um, which has been shaping a future agenda there. Um, and we certainly expect to be um, taking an active part in, in that going forward. Um, so we very much expect to be part of, mm. of, of that future. Could I just share an observation? I'm not expecting an answer to this, but I recently went to an economic forum in Edinburgh talking about Brexit, and there was the chair of a think tank from Brussels was saying, none of us can tell what the future will be, but if you consider what the role of the other 27 nations will be negotiating with Britain, if you were Spain, what would you do? Which was a rhetorical question. The first thing you will bid for is access to Scottish fishing, which seems a very logical point from the Spanish perspective. Um, clearly, that's been something you've looked at internally. What, what, what's your observation with that thoughts from that conference? Um, we have had, um, I mean, obviously, ministers are um, looking closely at, at, at these issues. Um, and Mr Ewing spoke at the Scottish Fishermen's Federation conference um, on, only last week. Um, access is um, one of the key areas where um, there is a big interest for Scotland going forward um, that needs to be carefully safeguarded. Mark Thank Roscoe. you. I mean, thanks, Convener. I mean, just further to that, I mean, what do you see 
the, the kind of the architecture of negotiation and enforcement being in a post um, CFP scenario, because I mean, obviously at the moment, you know, there's quite a well-defined set of negotiating structures as the you know, council of ministers in December, there's the regional advisory councils under the CFP, there's various kind of bilateral agreements between the EU and Iceland and Norway. I mean, is that, is that the way that you would see Scotland going and in terms of negotiation and then on enforcement, how, how would you see um, Scotland playing a, a, a role going forward in that? Would we still collaborate with countries or would we be continuing to enforce our waters? Um, uh, independently. I mean, at the, at the moment, we are involved in <coughs> negotiations involving Norway and non-EU states and, and, and Faroes and other, and other countries. So we are used to the sort of coastal state negotiations that take place and the arrangements that are put in place in dealing with management fish stocks that, that, that cross these international boundaries. The big difference in a post-EU situation is that you can no longer be part of the club, you can no longer be part of the EU club, and that would come with, with, with implications. Mm -hmm. And so that, would that obviously come with budget implications as well in terms of the time and the number of negotiations and forums that uh, your teams would have to be part of across, across Europe? Um, maybe ask Mike to come in on this at some stage, but I mean, in general, we are already there at the negotiations, but as part of a UK team and part of an EU team. Um, the difference is that in a, um, it, in a different situation, you, you would be responsible for your own science, your own compliance, so you would not have that being part of the club. The actual compliance task would still need to be done. The actual process of stock assessment and involvement in working groups would still need to be done as, as, a, as at present. The difference is that sort of level of um, not sharing and being part of something and, and having to defend it by, your, by yourselves. And, and that's, that could lead to more challenge. That could make it just a bit more difficult. But Mike will come in on some of this more detailed stuff. Yeah, sure. I mean, I'd, I'd endorse what, what Linda said there. Um, we are well experienced and well used to um, being involved in the kind of bilateral negotiations that, that you mentioned. And uh, I think in terms of negotiating resource and expertise, we would simply be turning that from being part of the EU negotiating team into being the Scottish negotiating team or, or potentially the UK negotiating team, however um, things developed. Um, so I think... I, I think in that way we are we are prepared for that, and 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 um, uh, uh, we, we we are ready to plan for that if necessary. Um, what often happens in the in in, in in the course of a negotiation is that that you receive requests to do extra bits of science and extra bits of research in order to underpin the arguments that you are making. Uh, uh, to seek to maximise your fishing opportunities. And that's very important because it needs to be evidence-based um, and, and it does need to be um, something that is grounded in sustainable fisheries management. So you really do have to do the science. Um, and as Linda was saying, what, what we currently do is to use the um, EU scientific frameworks. There is a, there is a committee called the STECF um, which is an EU scientific committee of which um, uh, we are a member. Um, and we are part of that apparatus and we get endorsement from that committee for doing different bits of science. Now, the actual operation of that science comes down to us. So it's not, it's not as if there's a body sitting in Brussels which goes away and does the science. They say, you do the science in Scotland. But, but, but they will give a little bit of direction. So we will be taking the initiative more ourselves on, uh, on exactly how we take those bits of science forward. Um, and that's, that's something that, that we will simply need to plan for and be prepared for. And have you got the resource to do that? Well, what I would say is that we currently tend to do that um, when we are asked to do it. So. Um, uh, uh, for example, um, in the past year off the west coast of Scotland, we have been asked 
um, by the European Commission to do um, a very strategic piece of science on the West Coast herring stock in order to underpin um, some of the proposals which we wish to put forward in terms of the fishing opportunities we should get from that. What we have done there is to collaborate with Ireland, with the pelagic fishing industry, um, uh, and with uh, the Netherlands um, in order to have a multi-partner research program uh, underway for that fishery. What we would wish to, to, to be in a position to do post-Brexit would be to continue that kind of collaborative work. Um, we would hope that uh, we would be able to continue that kind of collaborative work um, with those other nations um, on the basis that it's of mutual benefit to all the nations to have a better evidence base around that, that, that kind of issue. And on enforcement, are the three grey boats enough? Um, the question of, of how much is enough in terms of enforcement is a, is, is, is a tricky one. Um, the difference that would happen where we to be outside the EU um, is largely around the, the level of control we would need on other countries' vessels fishing in our waters and the overall responsibility for their catch. At the moment, we rely on other European countries because we're part of a shared system to um, police the sort of quota take-up of their vessels, even if they're fishing in our waters. Um, and our policing of their activities is, 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 is more about the sort of any immediate issues in terms of how they go about it. So there would be some additional um, sort of risk-based um, and procedures necessary. We have some experience of that already in our um, workings with Norway, where we have quite a lot of shared stocks. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Can, can I take this uh, very useful uh, information, take this in a slightly different direction. Uh, you know, as an organisation, you will anticipate work streams in areas of spend, but sometimes there's things that come out of left field. The impact of climate change is an ongoing issue. So in recent years, you've carried out research into the impact on migratory fish, the fact that fewer are returning to their native rivers. You've done a piece of work about the impact of, of the electric magnetic fields from undersea cables on, on that. And one presumes that that kind of stuff's going to continue to arise over a period of time. What capacity do you have resource-wise, budget-wise, built in to respond to the challenges that climate change may throw up? Um, I think the key way that we um, are able to respond is by increasing the flexibility of our staff. Um, we employ a lot of specialists um, and We've been moving in, in a direction in which we are encouraging, particularly the science staff, to be to be more flexible. Um, for example, an issue that can arise is invasive species, and you know, there we might look to um, if we if we have a particular um, event happening, we would look to um, using the core scientific capabilities that people have to work on that, to identify requirements, to secure partnerships with others, perhaps specialist research institutes in other universities or um, in, in perhaps the, the, the research councils. We're trying to ensure that they um, align more of their um, pots of money with um, real needs. Um, and we work with them to um, identify projects that could be taken forward. So that's our key way of, of responding to the unexpected, rather than having a pot of money with nothing attached to it that we can deploy. We've been able to bid into the Contract Research Fund, which is a, a pot of money that the Scottish Government holds for research that's of policy necessity in the rural affairs and okay. environment family. And that's been a very helpful source to us of um, sort of imminent needs. And that's underpinned a lot of our work um, on, on offshore energy. OK, thank you for that. Is there any other members um, of the committee have questions? No? OK, 
Well, can I thank the witnesses for attending, and particularly Linda Rosborough, who I think this is your last appearance in front of a parliamentary committee as you're stepping down next week, I think it is. That's true. Can I, on behalf of the committee and the parliament, wish you a very long and happy retirement and look forward to working with your successor. Um, at its next meeting on the 15th of November, the committee will take evidence on the draft budget 2017-18 from the Scottish Environment Protection Agency. As agreed earlier, we will now move into private session, and I ask that the public gallery be cleared as the public part of the meeting is closed. <laughs>